Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Thank you uh, to our panelists. And it gives me great pleasure now to introduce our next speaker, De Deputy Secretary of State John Sullivan. Um, before taking on his leadership position over at State Department, uh, Depsec Sullivan had a long career in law. He was the Supreme Court law clerk uh, and has held senior positions at Justice, Defense, and Commerce. Um, he's also a member of our USIP board, so it gives me special pleasure to introduce him. And I just want to note that um, his mother was a USO volunteer, his father served in the Navy, and his uncle Bill was a Foreign Service officer for 32 years. So clearly public service is a strong held tradition for Deputy Secretary Sullivan. And I understand he particularly and personally prioritized joining us today. So please join me in welcoming Deputy Secretary of State John Sullivan. Thank you for that kind introduction, Nancy. I'm honored to be here today with so many distinguished guests and supporters of the U.S.-Vietnam relationship. I'd like to recognize in particular the esteemed delegation from Vietnam that's traveled so far to be with us today, led by Lieutenant General Nguyen Chin Vi. I consider it a distinct privilege uh, to celebrate the unique history of our two countries, particularly the recent history. The gulf that the United States and Vietnam have bridged over the last two decades is nothing short of remarkable and a testament to our common interests, mutual respect, and bold resolve to overcome a very difficult past and look toward the future. As Nancy mentioned, I have a personal interest in this subject because, my, as Nancy said, my uncle was a uh, career foreign service officer for 32 years and focused a lot of his attention on Southeast Asia. He, uh, he was a political officer at our embassy in Saigon, a mid-level officer who had some junior officers uh, assigned to him named Holbrook and Negroponte. I think they went on to <laughs> do other things in, in, in their, their careers. Uh, but then he became uh, DCM shortly when Maxwell Taylor uh, was sent uh, to be our ambassador, helped him transition into his role as ambassador to South Vietnam, and then went, uh, was sent by President Johnson to be ambassador to Laos from 64, 1964 until March of 69. Uh, he was our ambassador in Vientiane. When he returned to Washington, he returned to the, uh, the East Asia Bureau and was a Deputy Assistant Secretary of State. But his principal assignment for the next four years was the senior State Department official working uh, with, for Henry Kissinger, uh, in August of, of 69, as, as you know, President Nixon tasked then National Security Advisor uh, Kissinger with establishing uh, secret uh, channel, secret peace talks uh, with, uh, with North Vietnam. And my uncle was the senior State Department representative assisting him and participating in, uh, in the negotiations that led ultimately to the Paris Peace Accords in January of, of 1973. So in the course of that, uh, that experience, he met, a, he met all of the, uh, the, uh, his counterparts from, from North Vietnam, from Le Duc Tho on, on down. Uh, and as a consequence, in the mid-1980s, as I understand it from my uncle, when the government, uh, the, the now Socialist Republic of Vietnam, was con try thinking about uh, writing its relationship or getting our relations, the relationship between the United States and, uh, and Vietnam back on track, they reached out to my uncle in 1988 and he visited Hanoi in, uh, in 1989 with then Foreign Minister Nguyen Ko Tak. And they established uh, in 89 the U.S. Vietnam Trade Council, which uh, was one of the, was one of an early vehicle for establishing some momentum, which ultimately led, of course, to the reestablishment of of diplomatic relations in in 1995. So we have a very personal interest in uh, in this topic uh, and in our relationship with with Vietnam. And over the last two decades, 
uh, the development of our relationship has been extraordinary. Our bilateral trade has grown to a level that would have been unthinkable to the foreign minister and my uncle in 1988. Uh, trade in goods between the United States and Vietnam in the last two decades has increased by 8,000 percent. In the last decade alone, U.S. exports to Vietnam have increased by over 300 percent. And American companies have invested billions in Vietnam to our mutual benefit. And of course, the growth between our two countries encompasses a great deal more than, than trade and investment. Politically, our engagement with Vietnam continues to need, reach new heights. Just last month, President Trump made his second visit to Hanoi in less than two years. This for his second summit with Kim, Kim Jong-un. While in Hanoi, President Trump in, invited Nguyen Phu Trong to visit Washington this year in what will be his second visit as General Secretary of the Communist Party and his first visit as President of the Socialist Republic of, of Vietnam. One consequence of two presidential visits to, to Vietnam and of Secretary Pompeo's visits to, uh, to Vietnam, I've been joking with my colleagues, I'm going to have to come up with a creative rationale for another senior U.S. government level visit by some deputy secretary of state to go, but I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm working on that. Uh, but these leader level exchanges are emblematic of the tremendous progress we've achieved since normalizing our diplomatic relations 24 years ago. We've moved past conflict and division toward a flourishing partnership that spans political, security, economic, and people-to-people -people ties. Today, Vietnam is an increasingly close friend and partner of the United States. We share a range of strategic issues and a common desire to promote peace, security, and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific region. Today, the United States and Vietnam work side by side to tackle some of the world's most pressing security challenges, from the final fully verified denuclearization of North Korea to peacefully resolving tensions in the South China Sea. Our defense cooperation has grown significantly. In 2017, we transferred to Vietnam the former U.S. Coast Guard cutter Morgenthau, a vessel that was active in the Vietnam War, ironically. Uh, today, it's the largest ship in Vietnam's fleet. Uh, in 2018, a much larger ship, a massive ship, the USS Carl Vinson made a historic port call to Da Nang, the first U.S. aircraft carrier visit to Vietnam since the war. Our people-to-people -to -people ties are stronger than ever. In the past two decades, American tourists to Vietnam have increased from fewer than 60,000 to over half a million. I uh, count my family among them. My wife and my, uh, my eldest son were uh, in Vietnam this fall on a, uh, as tourists. Uh, I hadn't anticipated uh, serving in government. In fact, I was thinking about retiring from my law firm. And my wife and I were planning trips, and the one trip I desperately wanted to go on was a trip to Vietnam. So my wife planned this great trip to Vietnam. Lo and behold, November 8th happened. One thing led to another. I became Deputy Secretary of State, and my son inherited my spot <laughs> on the trip to Vietnam. But I'm getting there, event. I promise you I will be there. We're coming up on a, uh, on a rationale for another senior level visit. But it's uh, the, num the number of students we have, Vietnamese students studying here in the United States has jumped from fewer than 800 to over 31,000 putting Vietnam in the top five countries in the entire world, sending students to the United States. A remarkable and, uh, and quite wonderful achievement. None of this would have been possible, of course, without work to build a foundation of trust to expand our relationship. The humanitarian mission to identify and bring home American soldiers missing in action was instrumental in establishing this trust and remains our sacred and solemn duty. We will not rest until we have achieved the fullest possible accounting of those missing from the war. And we will continue to work hand in hand to remove exploded, unexploded ordnance and clean up dioxin in Vietnam, which has been a priority for this, admi this administration from my first days and my first discussions on this topic with Secretary Mattis, who felt uh, as passionately or more passionately than I about that as a moral obligation for the United States. 
The United States views the Indo-Pacific as vital to our interest in, assure, in ensuring global peace, stability, and prosperity. Southeast Asia, and Vietnam in particular, has emerged in a, as an essential partner in these endeavors. We look forward to working with Vietnam to build a peaceful and prosperous Indo-Pacific region and reach new milestones in the U.S.-Vietnam relationship. The future of our bilateral relationship is very, very bright, and I can only imagine what uh, the late foreign minister and my late uncle must be thinking if they're looking down now at this, uh, this event here, is how our relationship has developed over the 40, 30 years since that first outreach uh, from Hanoi to my uncle here, uh, here in the United States. So thank you very much for allowing me to share these thoughts, including personal thoughts, with you today. Uh, this is a very important event. I know there have been terrific panel discussions, and the program will, uh, will continue. And I'll turn it back over to uh, USIP's Executive Vice President, Ambassador Bill Taylor, for the next panel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Bringing that, that personal, uh, personal touch to, uh, to, to this issue, this is great. The uh, third panel, uh, which uh, I have the pleasure of, of moderating, um, will be on the topic of the road ahead. Ah, thank you, Yancy. Uh, the road ahead, so we're now looking forward. Uh, now we're looking, we've talked about the work that's been done uh, we're talking about the work that's ongoing right now, and now we're looking forward. And to do this, help us do this, we've got a great panel, um, which I'm going to invite to come up as, uh, as I speak. And Elizabeth is already doing it, so th thank you, Elizabeth. So this is the order in which I will ask the first questions. And Tim's already, very good. We got eager people to do this, All right. So I will ask the first question to Senior Lieutenant General Wen Chi Vinh, who has already been introduced. Uh, Nancy introduced him this, this morning. General Vinh, welcome. Please uh, uh, come up. I will ask the second question to Patrick Murphy, um, who is the Acting Assistant Secretary of State um, uh, for the Bureau of East Asia and Pacific Affairs. Patrick, welcome. Uh, the third question then will go to Elizabeth Becker, who is standing right here. Elizabeth is the former New York Times correspondent author of When the War Was Over, Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge Revolution. Um, Elizabeth, uh, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author uh, and journalist, also award winning senior foreign policy editor for NPR. If I get this right, very good. Um, and then uh, Ambassador Hakim Nok. Uh, Ambassador uh, has also been uh, with us here this morning and you will hear more from him uh, at lunch. Um, he formerly, before he was the ambassador here, he was a deputy minister of foreign affairs. Um, and I noticed, uh, ambassador, you studied uh, in Kiev. And I'm be, I'll be on an airplane to Kiev uh, this, this, this evening. So uh, I'm glad to do this. And finally, Tim Reeser, um, known to everyone in this room, um, <laughs> a foreign policy aide, Senator Patrick Leahy. Um, and uh, I'll just say, his, his WikiLeaks page, his, sorry, his, his uh, wiki page says, uh, one of the most powerful staffs in Congress. So uh, this, uh, this is uh, undoubtedly true. So I'm going to leave this podium and come over here and join with uh, As I say, th as I say, this is uh, an opportunity to, to look forward. Um, so uh, 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 General, General Veen, um, we've talked about the work on uh, unexploded ordnance. We've talked about the work on uh, dioxin. Um, you've described that work. How are we going? And, and there was a question earlier on today, in the, I think at the end of the first panel, um, uh, a woman stood up and asked, how are we going to keep this momentum going? How are we going to keep this issue in front of us? How, as, as Vietnam veterans, um, and war veterans on both sides um, pass on, uh, which we will do. Um, how do we maintain our obligations to the children and the grandchildren? Uh, so this is, again, in, in the spirit of looking forward, um, I'd be interested in your thoughts uh, on, on that question, General. Uh, 
Thank you very much. When I took a break, uh, I received a question from various reporters. They asked me, when will this program end? And after we successfully overcome the consequences and war legacies, how does it affect the future of the U.S.-Vietnam relations? This is a, a, a burning question that, that I'd like to, to answer. I think that this program, today we sit here, we realize that we have overcome 30 years of excellent cooperation, and we have achieved significant outcomes uh, for the benefits and interests of our two countries and our two peoples. However, the cooperation in overcoming consequences of war are closely related to overcoming the consequences of uh, UXO and uh, Agent Orange and accent. We need to continue this momentum. But when? When the last remained of U.S. Uh, soldiers are returned and repatriated to their families and when it will end until the land areas of Vietnam does not possess any uh, risk of dangers towards our people, particularly the children. Uh, in recent years, facts and evidence have teach us had talked about one thing. Our cooperation does not only aim at overcoming war legacy, but we contribute and participate in the development course in resolving environmental issues, in exchanging experience on science and technologies for mutual development. And it is in line with the UN's um, Sustainable Development Goal and Millennium, Millennium Goal. And we not only we shelve the past, but we look forward to the futures. Our future generations, when they look back on what we we have done, they, they look at all of those endeavors. When they are completely unaware of the war, whether or not will they move forward with these activities? I think that for the youth, there are two uh, proposals. First, young generation should be proud of their nation and of their past struggle for national independence. They are very proud of that. They are proud of the past built thanks to uh, the efforts of the predecessors. And for American young people and for the future generation of America, I think that they will be very proud of the past of their predecessors when American predecessors uh, take the initiative to overcome the consequences of the war so that no one is left behind. And I think that um, the future generations will continue to take, take efforts to continue doing what we are doing now. Besides overcoming the war legacy and besides the issues of uh, the vir virtues, we're doing this for our two nations. This is a role model for the world to see, to apply, and they will see that uh, there is a mutual respect between U.S. and Vietnam. It creates a very favorable foundation for us to expand our cooperation in various areas, and it lay a synergy and lay a strong foundation for the trust. I think that trust is something that not only this current generation looks for, but the future as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the, the answer that, that it depends on our children, that it depends on, on the next generation to, to maintain this, I think is, uh, is, is important for us to have. Assistant Secretary Murphy, um, same kind of question. That is, how do we maintain the momentum um, from the U.S. side, um, from the U.S. government side, but broad, more broadly? We've got, a, we've got uh, a range of participants here, uh, private, government, non-government, how, how do we maintain that focus and momentum that, that we've heard about uh, uh, earlier today in terms of the work that's already been going? Yeah, thank you very much. I think the first observation to, to make in looking forward is that we are shaped by history in this relationship, but not held hostage by history. It's taken a lot of work, and you've heard a lot about that today, but I, I, I do want to acknowledge first that we ride on the shoulders of, of great giants, uh, courageous leaders on both sides, our many Americans and Vietnamese who sacrificed, um, and the, the leadership of key members of our Congress, uh, Senators Kerry, McCain, Webb, Congressman Pete Peterson, 
our first ambassador in the in the new relationship with Vietnam, and it carries forward now. Uh, Senator Leahy and many of his colleagues who focus on this region, and over the years, uh, the commitment, particularly of families, of those who sacrificed to help build the confidence in the foundations. And uh, Kelly McKeague is, is here today and leading our operations to, to full recovery. Those activities continue and we have a strong commitment uh, to our families and our Americans to help the Vietnamese continue their own recovery efforts and other legacies like unexploded ordinance and remediation of, of dioxin. So specifically, those activities will continue uh, we have the Binh Hoa Air Base uh, that is our next area of focus and we have committed funding and that commitment has carried over from one administration to the next. But we are building on these foundations to expand what we are doing. We heard today from uh, Deputy Secretary Sullivan the remarkable statistic that Vietnam is now in the top five of source countries of students coming to the United States. There's also the incredible opportunities that they have inside Vietnam itself. And we have been incredibly proud to partner in building Fulbright University Vietnam, FUV, down in Ho Chi Minh City, which is the first kind of academic institution that has an independent curriculum, independent faculty, and can provide the kind of education familiar to us Americans inside Vietnam. And that's an incredible partnership, took a lot, a lot of work to establish, but it's built on the foundations of four decades, uh, as the general referred to, building confidence and building, and building trust. This is an important year, and next year will even be more important. Next year is the 25th anniversary. We like to commemorate our milestones, but the 25th anniversary of normalized relations between the two countries. And we will look to find a whole variety of ways to celebrate it. It will fall during a very interesting year for Vietnam. Vietnam will once again assume the chair of ASEAN. And over the years, since the last time Vietnam did this, ASEAN has grown in its importance. It nests very importantly at the heart of our Indo-Pacific vision and strategy. And as chair of ASEAN, Vietnam will host close to 2,000 meetings over the course of a year. It's pretty remarkable. But most importantly, the big leader level meetings that occur towards the end of the year, the East Asia Summit, the US ASEAN Summit, and then a variety of minister cabinet level meetings during the, during the year. That is an opportunity for Vietnam to exercise what it's increasingly demonstrating, and as, that is leadership leadership in the, in the region, leadership in partnering with the United States on important issues like non-proliferation, non like maritime security, and the all-important foundation of ties between countries, people-to-people -people ties. So we're gonna have a lot to show for that. In the meantime, we are hoping to host later this year, Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister Phan Bin Minh, uh, laying the groundwork for what we hope will be a visit, as the uh, Deputy Secretary uh, previewed by uh, President and General Secretary Chong. That is what builds strong relations, is when leaders gather together. Also, we hope to see this year progress on a commitment that was made in 2016, but we need to see implemented. And we're making, we're making progress on this, and I see it over the horizon. And that is getting our first ever Peace Corps volunteers on the ground in Vietnam. As I like to say in my lifetime, going from boots on the ground to sandals and loafers on the ground. I can say that as a former Peace Corps volunteer. But think about that, bringing peace and not conflict, and the kind of partnership that that entails. We have come a long, long way uh, where, from where we were not that long ago with, with Vietnam. So these are the kind of things that we're going to be working on. We can't do it alone. You've referenced civil society and non-governmental organizations. Some of those partners are here today, and we look forward to, to working with all of you on those processes. Patrick, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we'll come back. There are a couple of, of good things. Um, Elizabeth. No. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, you've covered 
conflicts and negotiations, it's, it's on, or it will be on when you talk. Yeah, right. right now, this one's on. Okay. Soon this will be on. Um, you've looked for ways to and look, watch people searching for reconciliation. Um, um, I'd be interesting, interested if you have thoughts on lessons that you've learned that work or lessons that you've learned that don't work that you might give to uh, General Vinn or to Secretary uh, uh, Patrick uh, Murphy um, um, for as, as they go forward, again, with the idea that this panel is looking forward, what, what advice do you have based on what you've seen? Mm, I wouldn't be so presumptuous, okay. but, but thank you. Um, what I, co I covered since, well, I covered the war out of Cambodia. I was in Laos when the first POW came out, and I first visited post-war Vietnam in 1979, and I covered the first attempt at, at peace under President Carter, so it's been a long road. And the first thing I want to say is that um, when I was invited to the panel and was thinking about lessons learned from the Vietnam-United States experience, I remember asymmetrical warfare, and I think this was asymmetrical peacekeeping. Um, it's so highly unusual that um, a developing country like Vietnam was on the winning side and the United States was not. And to give you a sense of what it was like covering it right after 1975, the Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia desk was known affectionately as very lost causes. There was a deep freeze. No one wanted to talk about it. It was very hard. The refugee issue was okay. But what, what is astonishing about this long road, and I won't even go into the third Indochina War and the Vietnam Soviet Union versus um, Cambodia, China. I mean, it was layer upon layer of difficulty that I don't know any other um, peacekeeping um, attempt has had to face. So what I saw happening, and it took so many years, was that the United States very early said, this is our issue. It took a while for Vietnam to understand that, and I thought that made sense. It took them a while. And it, it took them a while to understand that their money was not going to come immediately. But then Vietnam found their issue. And in asymmetrical peacekeeping, when you have such an unusual um, disbalance between wealth, power, then you're going to have to look that way. And so if I were, if, if you're, I would say the model of Vietnam in the United States was first, the United States, within its own people and government, they were divided. And it took a long time for the Americans to agree on, an, on, a, on one issue. And it was not easy. And a lot of people lost their careers and a lot of people um, were very disappointed. I don't know the Vietnamese side, but I do know that I interviewed Nguyen Co Tak and General Vesey during their talks, and I know Nguyen Co Tak was very disappointed, and General Vesey was too, so it's a long decades, 20 years before diplomatic relations. So I think that's what will be looked at in the future by Institute of Peace. What does asymmetrical peacekeeping look like, peacemaking? Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, uh, asymmetrical, we will come back to this. Uh, this, this is worthy of, of pursuit. Um, uh, but before we do, uh, let me ask Ambassador Nong, um, who is managing this relationship here uh, for the Vietnamese government, um, and will have challenges. I mean, um, Secretary Murphy talked about uh, the upcoming uh, meetings, many of which will be at high levels um, as well. Um, when you look at the next year or two, um, while you're here, maybe longer, um, what do you, how do we maintain this momentum? How do we maintain the focus that, that we've talked about here today, Ambassador? Thank you, Ambassador Taylor. Um, I think on, uh, on the U.S. side, uh, we need the continued bipartisan support for U.S.-Vietnam relations, uh, no matter it's Republican or Democratic administrations. I think the support from both uh, Republican and Democratic parties are very crucial to the continued uh, cooperation between our two countries. And I think uh, for the past uh, several decades, we were lucky that we were able 
to build and consolidate the support uh, in the United States. And on our side, I think um, we have very clear and long vision uh, to strengthen and broaden cooperation and friendship with the United States. And today we discuss a lot about the world legacy issues. And I think um, it paved the way, it laid the very solid foundation not only for the past, for the current, but for the future cooperation in the next 25 years. Thank you, Ambassador. Tim, uh, it's on. It, it, whenever you start speaking, it will, it will be on. It's a magic, you know, it's, it's, it's magic. Uh, so, Senator Leahy this morning um, talked about the role that U.S. veterans in non-governmental organizations played in the, in the early days when we're thinking about you, uh, unexploded ordnance and Agent Orange dioxin. Um, what did we learn from that? How, how did we overcome the resistance? There, and you mentioned earlier that there was resistance. And how did, how, because that may have lessons for us as we move forward, uh, recognizing that, that resistance. So uh, how, can, how, how, do we, how do we get where we are now? Well, let me just say, first of all, one of the things I've learned in the 33 years I've worked in the Senate is that when everybody has said everything and you're the last person to speak, there's no need to repeat what's already been said. I wish more people in the Senate actually would learn that. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, I also want to thank USIP. This was actually General Vinh's idea. Uh, when I was in Vietnam last, he asked me about the idea of, that he had of convening something like this and really to educate people about what we've been doing all these years, which a lot of people, other than those in this room who have played such a critical role in it, uh, aren't aware of in either country, but particularly in this country. So this was an opportunity to inform people that for the United States, while we all remember 1975, a lot has happened since, and it's been the result of the work of so many people here, who have many of whom have been mentioned, and I really uh, have, for myself, just tried to carry on the work of others. And um, so when I think back, though, early in the process in the 1980s, when the United States government was not ready, really, uh, other than the MIA issue, to uh, engage with Vietnam, it was, with the, ex with the addition of General Vesey and Fred, who was there, it was Vietnam veterans on their own initiative not knowing how they would be received, going to Vietnam, and reconnecting with people uh, who they had once fought against. It was NGOs who wanted to begin to do humanitarian work there, who took the initiative. Uh, it was, and in the case of Agent Orange, it was Charles Bailey and the Ford Foundation long before the United States government was prepared to take on that issue because it was such a sensitive uh, and difficult one um, that did the groundwork for helping to define the problem in a way that we could conceivably take it on. So to me, the lesson there is that really for other countries who perhaps have similar experiences, it's often private citizens who act first, who take the initiative and who show governments what needs to be done. And, and then people like myself, learning from them, have been able to carry on in ways that have brought us to this point. And, you know, as been said, and I think General Vin said it exactly how I would, um, you know, from the beginning of this, our goal was to get beyond these issues to be able to really focus on the new challenges that Vietnam and the United States face. And yet we recognize that there was a lot of unfinished business that we had to address. 
uh, and it took a long time. It took a lot longer than we wish it had, but we can see today, I think, by virtue of the fact that we're all here, uh, how much has been accomplished and that, you know, we have a long way to go. But um, we now know that uh, what's possible and, and we have the kind of partnership that will make that possible. Tim, thank you, and thank you for your leadership on this whole uh, event um, and on, on this whole issue. Before I open it to questions from the audience, so get ready, get your questions ready here. Let me, uh, someone is probably not going to ask about asymmetric peace building, <laughs> so let me do that. I mean, at the Institute of Peace, we, we, uh, we think about peace building and negotiating, and the idea of asymmetric is, uh, is an interesting one, which you should uh, have, take this opportunity to elaborate on a little bit, Elizabeth. Oh, thank you, Bill. Um, well, one of the, this is this this was a long process, and there's no way I'm going to review 30 years of, of negotiations. But just to give you an idea of of what I was thinking of, we've heard tourism mentioned twice within the constant people to people, and all of my distinguished panelists have talked about. America's not truly understanding what's happened since 1975. The one time that they really concentrate on what's happened since 1975 is when they're in Vietnam. And we've all been to the museums. I was just inside Ho Chi Minh City last week. I went to the War Museum and I was with a a group of very educated Americans who knew not much about Vietnam. They said, did this really happen? Did this really happen? Did blah, blah, blah. So I thought, do you know what they could really use? They could use the reconciliation house next to it. The United States and Vietnam could have a nice, wonderful house that they've seen the war. Now let's see what we've done with reconciliation. And it would be commemorating what you all have done in this extraordinary day. So that's asymmetrical. Very good. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm, yes, General Venn. Let me uh, introduce uh, to you uh, Reconciliation House, as you mentioned. Let's go to Da Nang Airport. Uh, the place that we have uh, a commemorative uh, stellar uh, to commemorate uh, for the both Vietnamese and uh, American uh, young people. Uh, they also mentioned that uh, that's a, a place with a very heavy battlefield, but now is the best place for cooperation. I think uh, is a very good uh, destination in terms of uh, reconciliation between the two countries. So um, let me. Okay, people have been waiting to ask these questions here. Let, let, let me start right here, the lady in blue. Yes, and there's a there is a uh, mic coming. If you would identify yourself, uh, and if there's a particular person on the panel you'd like to address it to, over to you. Okay, so my name is Patricia Shake, and I'm with uh, Roots of Peace, the organization that was mentioned in panel one. We do development work in Vietnam, and we've done this since 1997, largely through private sector funding. Uh, my question is to Tim Reeser. Uh, it concerns the U.S. budget. And with the increased pressure on the U.S. budget on the, on the non-military side, and also with respect to the increased attention being paid to health issues, both for our own citizens that have been victims of the war and Vietnamese citizens, and also because Vietnam is a, a, a model for development, and so they're not really a developing country that we think of in the poor sense. How does the U.S. government, uh, if well, should it commit some of its funding to development purposes? Because there are a large number of, uh, of minority groups in Vietnam and women who have been left out of the equation, especially in rural areas where we do most of our work. Excellent question. Tim, I'm going to take two questions at a time. So if you'll keep that one in mind, right. You may, <laughs> I'll try. So we'll do, yes, yes. Oh, a mother. Yes, sir. And here, here, comes, here comes the mic. Bobby Muller, Vietnam Vet. We're talking about the future, okay? And it's obvious by everything that's happened now that there is an increasing recognition of the importance of the strategic security alliance between the United States and Vietnam, 
for obvious purposes, uh, you know, confronting China's expansionism, et cetera, et cetera. So we have an, a real interest in the future of Vietnam. I'm curious, has there been any discussion about the coming climate changes and the profound effect it's going to have on all the low-lying areas of Vietnam and its impact on the country? Excellent question. So why don't we, uh, Tim, you're obviously uh, best place to answer the, the funding question. And some, uh, Patrick, you're on the climate change. Excellent. Tim. I'm going to make this very quick. As long as Senator Leahy is the vice chairman of the Appropriations Committee, we're not going to have a problem with funding. Thank you, Tim. Uh, Patrick, uh, climate change. I'm not sure I can match that. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Uh, I think first what I want to mention is what we have with Vietnam, between Vietnam and the United States, is a comprehensive partnership. That's a very deliberative category with emphasis on comprehensive. So it covers the full gamut of issues that any two countries could have to contend with. And this week is a great example. General Veen is here. We're taking a look back. We also have Vice Foreign Minister uh, Sung, who is here for a political security and defense dialogue. We have another Vice Foreign Minister coming in to partake in our U.S. ASEAN dialogue. We also have coming up in a couple of months a bilateral human rights dialogue. That's the important dimension to comprehensive. That means two partners can talk about areas of collaboration and, and cooperation and partnership, but also areas where we see things differently. And we have some very real, important differences on human rights that we regularly discuss. And what I can tell you about that aspect of this relationship, we have many human rights dialogues around the world. This is one where everything is on the table and we genuinely can point to progress. We would like to see more progress, but we can talk about everything because we have this confidence uh, that's built on the contributions so many have made here. Another aspect of the relationship is to deal with very real present challenges. And indeed, we hear frequently from Vietnam and other par uh, partners uh, the very existential threats that climate change poses. The nice thing to look forward to in this relationship is we have a foundation here. We have something called the Lower Mekong Initiative. Vietnam was a founding partner along with the other four Lower Mekong countries. This year we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Lower Mekong Initiative, a great milestone once again. Vietnam very early on identified itself, self-proclaimed, self-identified desire to be the co-chair with the United States on the environment pillar within the Lower Mekong Initiative. That reflected both the challenges that Vietnam faces, but also some expertise that Vietnam is growing uh, in, in knowledge about climate change and about ways to be prepared for changes that are already occurring but all, will be coming in the, in the future. From our perspective, it's about resilience, helping to build resilience, particularly in the agriculture se sector, but also, as, as you noted, sir, with your question, those low-lying areas, Vietnam, among the lower Mekong uh, countries, faces some of the biggest challenges along the Delta area. Uh, they're not alone. These challenges are also shared in particular by Laos and Cambodia, um, and they're dealing with it, and they're confronting it head on. And we have a mechanism, we have programs through USAID and other you know, agencies where we're, at, where we're advancing those efforts. Patrick, thank you. Uh, Ambassador General, any thoughts on climate change you want to do at this point? Uh, I just yeah. I just want to add one more aspect that the United States uh, plays a very important role um, in the Lower Mekong Initiative. Uh, you know already that uh, the non-conventional security issue is rising and the, the water issues, uh, the environment issues are so significant uh, among ASEAN's country and, and especially in cooperation with the United States. So we uh, strongly encourage uh, the United States to play a pr more proactive role in this process. Good advice, good advice. Okay, yes, sir. Well, the first and then the second right here, right. Thank you. Brian Eiler from the Stimson Center. 
And I have a question that any of the panelists can answer, but it's most squarely focused towards Patrick Murphy and Ambassador Knott. Um, and it requires a little bit of creative thinking because it, uh, it's thinking outside, not the box, but outside of the US-Vietnam relationship and more broadly about engaging with Cambodia and Laos, where the legacies of war also occur. Uh, and the war spilled over uh, into that region um, and then continued on, as, as Elizabeth noted earlier in her comments. Um, uh, I think between the US and Vietnam, our relationship, a collective relationship with Cambodia and Laos is quite strong. When you break it apart, it kind of becomes a little bit more difficult. But collectively, are there ways that the US and Vietnam can play to comparative advantages um, within the relationship uh, to move forward progress on war legacy issues in Laos and Vietnam? And just citing that, you know, there are uh, mountainsides in the Central Highlands in Vietnam wh where uh, people who are exposed to Agent Orange dioxin um, are getting adequate uh, help. But just on the other side in Laos, there are folks who don't know what they're going through, and there's nobody there that can help them. Thanks. Thank you, Brian. And right behind, yes, yes. Good morning. Thank you very much. My name is Nike Chin. I'm the State Department correspondent for Voice of America. Um, as Principal Days, Patrick Murphy just mentioned, State Department is going to host a U.S. ASEAN dialogue la later this week. Um, my question is for uh, Principal uh, Das Murphy and also Ambassador. Um, a Secretary Pompeo cautioned European allies uh, the risk posted by Chinese telecommunication company Huawei and the use of its equipment when nations are moving towards 5G network. Is the US asking ASEAN the same questions? Will it complicate US partnership with ASEAN? And uh, for Ambassador, um, what is your take on this issue when US and Vietnam are building and enduring partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you. So two questions, both for Patrick and the ambassador. Uh, and so you can take them in either order. Uh, uh, ambassador, you <laughs> I'll try and be brief. There are a couple of broad questions there. I think first on the relationships that we have with, uh, with Cambodia and Laos. Uh, first on, on Laos, it's improved tremendously over the decades. Uh, also built on confidence and trust uh, through the full accounting effort. Uh, the League of Families, and Mills Griffith is here, and others have uh, worked incredibly hard on that for years, and, and we've seen that come along. It's not without its challenges. Um, and we face, right now, we face some particular challenges on our trafficking in persons issues with Laos. Uh, they're not in a very good place. And Laos, like other countries, we're looking to, to see them take back their nationals who have run uh, their uh, legal means to stay in the United States. Um, Cambodia has been particularly scratchy in the last couple of years. In the bigger picture, and I think you're right to refer to the bigger picture, Cambodia has come a long way since its own very, very dark chapters. Um, but we have some we have some obvious challenges with backsliding on democracy and human rights. But I think the answer to your question is one of the best ways from our perspective to work with these countries is in the multilateral context. We have our low, various layers of good work where we can achieve a lot together. Our Lower Mekong Initiative, US plus five. The US ASEAN relationship, that's United States plus 10. The ASEAN Regional Forum is 27 countries. The East Asia Summit is 18. Laos and Cambodia and the United States are all participants. And these bring together countries to find common ground with ASEAN centrality at the core. It's a principle we embrace. So ASEAN uh, works on a consensus basis. You're driven by finding common ground. And we see that frequently occur on issues of common concern and, and including big, you know, big regional challenges. So I'm a I'm a big fan in answering that question to point to our multilateral architecture in the region. And that works nicely with our new approach to the Indo-Pacific. Indo uh, with regards to the question about uh, Huawei... Patrick, you, why don't we, why don't we yep, skip absolutely. comments on your first point? Yep, uh, I think you're and right. And we'll come back to the, the Chinese. Ambassador? Yeah. And then Elizabeth. Yeah, I uh, just want to add um, 
a few comments. I think um, between Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, we share many things in common. And with the United States, uh, for example, in the MIA joint field activities, uh, Vietnam and the United States, we have the bilateral cooperation, but with our neighboring countries, with Laos and Cambodia, we also have the trilateral cooperation. We send our soldiers, our witnesses, our specialists to Laos and Cambodia. And I think the uh, joint field activities, the trilateral between Vietnam, the United States, and either Cambodia or Laos, um, brought about tangible result, very productive. And we also have many other areas of cooperation, and I think my uh, friend Patrick Murphy already mentioned, uh, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam, we are all lower Mekong uh, countries, and we have worked very closely in terms of uh, water management, environment protection, and I think um, we are also ASEAN countries, uh, so we uh, coordinated very closely, and especially uh, when ASEAN and uh, the United States already have strategic partnership, so we have many areas of common interest uh, to work together with the United States. Thank you, Ambassador. Elizabeth, you have a comment? Sure. Um, I think the elephant in the room is China on this question, and um, the, the China is, is, as Brian knows, China's at the center of the, the Lower Mekong Dam question, and China, in, recently in Cambodia, has been very good at driving a wedge with the United States. Um, so I think it, it would be very hard to answer that question without saying, excuse me, but China's playing a new role, and it's not going to help in any way with um, U.S. Um, Indo-Chinese relations. Tim, anything on this? Only on the question of Laos, and you mentioned Agent Orange in Laos. We've been, as John Brothers here knows, we've been working for many years to address the cluster munitions problem in Laos, uh, and that is ongoing, and it's a huge problem, and it will continue uh, to be one that we work at. But Agent Orange in Laos is actually not a subject we know very much about, uh, but I would at least be interested uh, in knowing more about who potentially was affected uh, in what way, and maybe there is something that we should be doing. Thank you, all three. Um, on the Huawei question, uh, Patrick, do you want, I cut you off before you were about to answer that one. And that's getting to that elephant in the room. Um, I, I first want to note, Elizabeth, you, you referred to uh, our, our desks and a different time some decades ago. I'm very proud to note, though, since we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Lower Mekong Initiative, that was an idea that actually came from desk officers, uh, career foreign service officers, relatively junior. Um, and it was an idea that uh, resonated with the, the then administration leadership, and it, and it persists and survives today, uh, a great partnership. On, on Huawei, let me first say in our vision for the Indo-Pacific, the key tenets include respect for sovereignty, uh, the independence of foreign policies of all individual nations, uh, big and small. So when it comes to kind of the kind of decisions countries need to make as they prepare for the fifth generation of communications technology, they will make their own decisions. What we do is in our national interests, we see with companies like Huawei that are supported, if not directed, by central authorities in China, we see challenges and potential threats to the sanctity the security of our systems and our networks. And the best we can do with our friends and partners and allies is share our information, share our experience, take note that we have our national interests and national security to protect. And that's the reference to Secretary Pompeo. And we will take uh, the steps necessary to protect our national security. But we share that information with countries and the, their decisions on their own uh, networks and systems and, and the protection thereof will, will be their decisions going forward. And yes, we do discuss this with all of our partners uh, because it is a, a both a present opportunity as countries prepare uh, to adopt a fifth generation, but also there are inherent challenges and risks that we face in the 21st century. Good. Uh, next couple of questions here. Uh, sorry? Ambassador, do you want to? 
I think we are open for cooperation with uh, uh, other countries, with uh, the cooperation from other countries. But I want to echo my uh, colleague, uh, Patrick Murphy, that we have one principle, that they need to respect our sovereignty, national sovereignty. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, okay, so one question right here, and then one all the way in the back. Um, Hi, Michael Martin from Congressional Research Service. Um, question actually eventually could be to all the panelists. So dealing with the war legacies issue in Vietnam, we started with MIAs, US MIAs. We moved on to UXO in great measure to the efforts of Senator Leahy and Tim, you individually. We moved then on to Agent Orange Dioxin and have made great progress there. But it seems we haven't totally closed the loop on this issue which is the Vietnamese MIAs. We heard a little bit about it earlier. There is some cooperation going on, but the figure of 200,000 MIAs in Vietnam was raised earlier. So for Ambassador Nock and General Vin, what would you like to see of the level of effort from the United States to address your MIA issue? But for those who know me, I can't make it always nice, how are you going to deal with the MIA issue in your country, regardless of which side of the conflict they fought on? Then for Tim and Patrick, and I hope you don't mind, I've known you both for a number of years, what would you see as a proper U.S. role in that effort? We went to them with our effort or our desire to see the remains of our veterans come home. What should the U.S. do? So that the Viet, uh, for the Vietnamese people, so that they can see their sons and daughters come home. Thank you, Mike. Good question for all, all of the panels. Well, Maybe. She, she, uh, <laughs> she got her son on that. Yes, ma'am. All the way in the back. Hi, um, my name is Sonia Schoenberger, and I'm a law student. Um, and my question is directed to whomever feels comfortable answering. I'm curious about the role of litigation against the U.S. companies that produced Agent Orange for the U.S. government um, and how that has affected and continues to affect U.S.-Vietnam relations. Um, more specifically, if I'd be curious to learn if and how the, the litigation before U.S. courts in the mid-2000s shaped collaboration on war legacies issues, and also looking forward, um, how ongoing litigation in foreign courts can be seen as productive or counterproductive in the context of U.S.-Vietnam relations. Thank you. So, so what year law, law uh, school are you in? Second year. Second year. Very good. Okay. We, Okay, on the first question, on uh, Vietnamese MIAs, um, uh, open, f that's to everyone here. General? With regards to Vietnamese MIA rise since 1975, the Vietnamese government ex exhausted every channel of resources and conditions to identify the names and uh, locate them and bring them back to their families. The Vietnamese government always attaches importance to the accounting and recovery of uh, Vietnamese MIA, and we have been exerting significant effort into that. The search for Vietnamese missing in action is very difficult. The uh, identification of them, DNA is, uh, efforts are very difficult. So the figure 200,000 is quite modest compared to what happened in realities. Over the years, the Vietnamese government has developed a national steering committee for the uh, recovery of uh, Vietnamese MIA. And with the significant support from the U.S. Out of counterparts, the U.S. provides us with information that they have to us. For example, they uh, provide information to mass grave in Bien Hoa Air Base. We specifically would like to thank the Vietnamese veterans for sending us the information that they collected when they uh, 
carry out their duties in Vietnam. They provided us with books, memoirs, and diaries, and we thank them a great deal for providing us those information. On the other hand, we think that we have to carry that burden on our shoulders. But with the support of the United States, we consider them very um, important, but to some extent for us. What we truly highly appreciate is the friendship and the sentiments and, 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 and what has, you know, the, the beautiful gestures attended to us. The U.S. side, um, we uh, hope and uh, you will have a government agency as the coordinator on your side to collect the data, the information, the documents relating to Vietnamese soldiers missing during the war time, uh, so that we can deal with that issue in a very uh, systematic way. Um, with the information you, uh, your side, your soldiers, your veterans provided us, it's case by case. But we need a more uh, concerted, organized, organized um, agency so that we can have it um, um, in a more systematic way. I think it will be more effective to do that way. Thank you. Ambassador. Thank you. Tim, and then. Very briefly. Senator Leahy, uh, a few years ago, included, uh, I think it was a million dollars uh, in the budget for uh, programs to assist Vietnam in improving its DNA analysis capacity for exactly this reason, um, because we felt that Vietnam was doing a lot uh, to help locate and identify U.S. MIAs. We wanted to try to reciprocate, saw this as another area where we could cooperate. Uh, and we're looking for uh, ways to expand that uh, in the future. Uh, when Senator Leahy travels to Vietnam in three weeks, that's going to be one of the subjects on the agenda because we need the Vietnamese to tell us how we can best help them, uh, recognizing that it's a huge job, um, but there are certain capabilities that we have that we want to be able to share with them uh, to, uh, to be of as much assistance as possible. Yeah, I think in general terms, it's, it's already been said, uh, just to fully agree with General Veen, often this comes down to uh, information sharing. Um, Kelly McKeague and our uh, recovery uh, agency uh, work very closely anytime information is available to apprise our Vietnamese counterparts and we are certainly committed to doing everything we can this effort's been underway for a number of years uh, I see Ambassador Veen and Ambassador Scheer here respective uh, Vietnamese and, and US ambassadors during their tenure a lot of discussions were underway on how to improve this along the lines of of what Ambassador Knopp is referring to making this more systematic but much as we, we are, are driven by doing the right thing for our families and our country, uh, we follow the lead of Vietnam in, in doing the same for its population. So we have time for two last questions then. Um, and I see one of them right here, lady in red. Any other, uh, maybe that's, ah, and right. Oh, I am, yeah. thank you. Elizabeth, the, the, of course, the law student question. Agent Orange, um, litigation against the companies. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, any takers on that question? Tim knows the answer. Tim knows the answer, Elizabeth says. <laughs> you know, as a former lawyer myself, litigation to me suggests um, some kind of uh, uh, advocacy or antagonism, you know, where you're your opponents. And in this case, I don't think that's where we are. I think we're talking about how to resolve problems amicably, and we are doing that. So litigation really isn't part of our thinking, and I don't think it's really relevant to us. Uh, at least it isn't to me. And our view is that we're kind of beyond that point. We've found ways to cooperate. Uh, we want to expand that cooperation. Thank you, Tim. There you go. Yes, ma'am. 
Um, yes, last, Susan. Last Hammond. two questions here, and then uh, I think one right behind there was. A, yes, yeah. sir. Yeah. Susan Hammond with the War Legacy Project. I've been working in the region for the past 20 odd years on Agent Orange and unexploded ordnance. And this is a question, a little going back to what um, Tim had said about as long as Senator Leahy is on the committee, then we're not going to worry about funding. But I. Being a Vermonter, I worry about Senator Leahy retiring. He will one day. But being someone working on more legacy issues, I particularly worry about what's next. Um, and has this example of Vietnam and the US working together to overcome these war legacies, and how important that is in developing the relation, relationships between the two countries, has that helped ensure that in the future, not just between Vietnam and US, but US and, and Laos and Cambodia war legacy issues and other Afghanistan, Iraq and so forth. Is that helping to ensure that there will be future funding for war legacies in other places as well? Because the example has shown how important it is to address those issues so we can move on to a better relationship. Thank you, thank you, Susan. And that keeps with the, with the theme of this panel, which is how to move forward on this thing. So we'll come back to, to that question. Um, yes, sir, last question. Yeah. You could John McAuliffe, again, from the Fund for Reconciliation and Development. First, to follow the discussion of Vietnamese MIA information, the Pentagon is currently spending millions of dollars on its 50th anniversary commemorations if the Pentagon incorporated into its outreach to veterans to get the kind of information that VVA and v Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation have done through their members to get the same kinds of journals, the same kinds of first person accounts, I think they could turn this anniversary commemoration into a, a productive, more productive than just backwards looking. But I want to look backwards a minute to something else and ask Tim uh, uh, and Secretary Murphy particularly. Um, the, in about six months is the 50th anniversary of the moratorium where two million Americans all over the country demonstrated against the war. Um, to some extent, the momentum that Tim and his senator have reflected was the momentum of the old anti-war movement and the veterans, some of whom were also in the anti-war movement. I mean, it's somewhat, it's, it was a generational, how much was there a generational factor affecting what has happened so far? And then to Secretary Murphy, how much does the, and, and to Ambassador Nock, how much does the problem which is going to be with us as forever as the legacy issues, the problem of China's role in the region, and ironically, the common interests of the US with Vietnam, had we only recognized them in 1945, we would have spared a whole lot of tragedy. Um, but the, the common interests, how enduring are the common interests of the US and Vietnam uh, to maintain, to foster a deeper relationship. Thank you, John. Uh, Tim, do you want to answer Susan's question? Uh, uh, no, please. One of the reasons that Senator Leahy is uh, traveling to Vietnam again in three weeks with uh, nine other senators, uh, several of whom are uh, much younger than him, is for exactly the reason that we want to see this continue. We want to educate more people in the Congress about why these uh, programs uh, uh, exist and the importance of them for both countries. And, you know, we can't predict the future. We don't know who will take these on in the future, but, but I think our job is in part to uh, expose others to what is being done and to encourage them to support this uh, both today and uh, in the future. So we're hopeful that that happens. And, and you know, we already have members of Congress who have expressed an interest. So at least speaking with respect to the Congress, I think there will be support. Um, on the generational question that John asked, you know, I, I was, uh, I turned 18 in 1970. So I was actually old enough to be drafted 
uh, and sent to Vietnam. And at the time, the military draft was a lottery by then. And I was, in my view, very fortunate that I got a high number. So I did not have to, at that point, worry that I would be sent to Vietnam. Um, but I did know people who were, who enlisted and who were drafted, and some of whom did not return from Vietnam. Uh, so I lived through that period, as did Senator Leahy, obviously. Uh, I remember that moratorium march. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the very lucky things for me uh, working in the Congress has been being able to find a way to serve in a different way, but on behalf of both Vietnam and the United States, having not done so 45 years ago. Thank you, Tim. Ambassador, did you want to say something about the uh, John's question on legacy and, and the generational question? I think uh, with the uh, process of cooperation uh, between our two countries, um, we were able to overcome the hatred, the resentment. Uh, we were able to turn bad to good, from foes to friends. And now we uh, share many common strategic interests in the region. Uh, you always talk about China, but we have many other stuff to work together to maintain peace, uh, stability, uh, cooperation in the region, uh, or support ASEAN, uh, you know, with the central role in this region. And recently, we even worked together to push the peace uh, negotiation, the denuclearization in the Korean Peninsula. So I strongly believe that we have very solid foundation uh, for the uh, further cooperation in many, many generations to come. Thank you, Ambassador. Patrick. Well, uh, that's a great segue, uh, Ambassador Nup, because I fully agree. This is a multi-dimensional relationship, far more expansive than unified over a single regional issue. Um, it, the, the United States actually in Vietnam polls very well. Uh, the favorability ratings of the United States are higher in Vietnam than they are in the United States. Uh, we think less of the United States than the Vietnamese do. I like that uh, statistic. Um, and in part what it reflects is that Vietnam is a very young country, uh, like other countries in Southeast Asia. The vast majority of the population was born well after the conflict. And of course, Vietnam has had a number of conflicts uh, over the centuries. Uh, the conflict with the United States was just one among many. So it's not as defining in Vietnam as it is for us. And, and I mean, I agree with, with Tim, all of us of a certain generation have Vietnam memories. It frames uh, the way we look at the world in some regards. Um, we have a family member who went to Vietnam and on his second deployment there didn't come back. Uh, like many Americans, 1968 was a pretty terrible year. It's quite different in Vietnam. It is a much more forward-looking society. We have uh, also uh, now hitting a milestone, our Young Southeast Asian Leadership Initiative, YC Lee, uh, is at its five-year mark. And one of the most uh, active countries in Southeast Asia with this program is Vietnam. Tens of thousands of young Vietnamese have signed up and are active members. They're entrepreneurs, they're creative young thinkers, uh, they are the future, using innovation and entrepreneurialism to solve not just Vietnam's problems, but the region's problems. So we're all looking, we're all looking forward. At the same time, there was a question about UXO. I can't answer hypotheticals about other conflicts around the world. In, in this region, the Asia Pacific, I hope we never have a, another conflict. Uh, but we still do contend with the remnants, and UXO is a pretty important aspect. And I think it it's rare we say this in policy making, but on these issues, we are genuinely motivated by doing the right thing. Vietnam, we've spoken about today. Laos, the most heavily bombed country in the history of the world. Cambodia, arguably one of the most heavily mined countries. Now, we're not responsible for all of that. Uh, we, Cambodia has shared with its neighbors and others the mining challenge, but we're motivated by doing the right thing. It's the right thing for public health, for economic prosperity, 
um, and to fix the wrongs of the past so that we have productive futures. Thank you, Patrick. Elizabeth, you get the last word. Um, well, um, as a historian who, who researched and wrote, wrote about this whole period, I can say to John's question, um, there's no way that I would have 100% faith that going forward, lessons would be learned and we wouldn't make similar mistakes. I mean, any historian will tell you that. Um, and that there are things that are gonna come up that we can't even imagine. Who would have guessed that the third Indochina war would be Vietnam and Cambodia? It was supposed to be the dominoes. So um, no one can give you an assurance of that, that, that yes, the United States would have kept Ho Chi Minh as their agent in World War II and then gone on to peace and, and tranquility. The Cold War intervened, but, um, and this is my great segue, with a, a day like this, it brings me hope that the lessons will be put somewhere and maybe the next Patrick Murphy will pick it up and continue learning those lessons. Elizabeth, I'm glad you had the last word. <laughs> thank you very much. Tim, Ambassador General, Patrick, Elizabeth, thank you very much for sharing this. Please join me in thanking Patrick.